everyone. My name is Petros Terzis. I'm a PhD student at the University of Winchester. And I think that my paper sort of builds on the importance of moral philosophy uh, for this community as expressed by our previous speaker. So if you plan on reading it, I recommend you reading it letters paper first. In short, the present paper argues that it's worth exploring in a broader social context why the ethical AI debate failed, and it further attempts a paradigm shift in the way we understand and strive for morality. To achieve this, it draws on the philosophical realm of existentialism by zooming into the ethics, responsibility, and freedom of the individuals. Existentialism begins and ends by acknowledging the infinity of people's freedom. If Sartre is right and if people are condemned to be free, then a discussion on the ethics of AI is a genuine fallacy unless it categorically declares the absolute freedom of every AI person. From the rich project manager of a tech company to the underpaid micro worker, there is nothing natural that constrains individuals' actions. No abstract principles, no inescapable situations, and no inevitable future. In as much as the ethics debate camouflages this freedom under given circumstances, then the result will be nothing more than what Sartre calls bad faith. A wall we intentionally build, a wall, a wall we, that we intentionally build in order to Excuse me. And what we intentionally build between ourselves and the realization of our true freedom. Think of the CEO who justifies investment in facial recognition by invoking an unavoidable future that we need to line up behind. An existentialist would reject outright every unavoidability and all the given circumstances as bad faith. Because for them, the first step towards understanding our authentic and genuine freedom comes when we denounce everything given and subsequently when we accept the ontological possibility of every choice we have. The second step is illustrated by Beauvoir in her long essay, The Ethics of Ambiguity. Beauvoir believed that bias is deeply rooted in every human being. Nevertheless, she was confident that this was an invaluable asset of human nature. For understanding that we are all biased is another step towards understanding the dimensions of our freedom. If she is right, this inherent unavoidability of human biases also calls us to rethink our approach vis-a-vis -vis fairness in machine learning models. If indeed bias is unavoidable, then the questions that fat star community starts from need to be revised. Instead of under undertaking the Sisyphean task of mitigating bias, a data scientist's primary responsibility lies in disclosing the system bias and let individuals in society consciously decide if and how they want a bias system in the first place. The alternative is an immersion into the abyss of balancing trade-offs, a process often doomed to dangerous abstraction. Beauvoir believed that there can be no ethics for all. She writes, and I quote, to work for some people is often to work against others. One cannot settle on this peaceful solution to want the well-being of all people. Thomas Metzinger explains this clearly by describing the consultation of the European Commission's high-level expert group on artificial intelligence and how the red lines succumbed to pressure by industry leaders ended up becoming critical concerns. Confronted with this illusionary power of principles that cultivate bad faith instead of ethics, and deprived from our ability to tear our biases apart, existentialism brings to light a different angle from which we can view ethics. It moves the debate away from the ethics of AI to focus on the authenticity, the being genuine of AI makers. This paradigm shift would transform every ethical initiative into an initiative for discussing authentically around ethics. Suffice it to say that the ethics for supply chains free from conflict materials and exploitation, the ethics for UX design free from manipulative dark patterns, and the ethics for decision-making processes conditioned on the parameter of climate justice are all one and the same movement and under the same agenda, not standalone independent enterprises. In parallel with this business transformation towards authenticity, an authentic commitment to ethics would also involve the transcendence of all the individuals involved, from the CEO to the micro worker. This transcendence, an existentialist would argue, consists of three incremental stages. Firstly, it begins with a conceptualization of an absolute freedom whose boundaries expand well beyond one's professional identity. Heidegger believed that to understand our existence, we must set it side by side with something that defines our historical heritage. For Heidegger, when I act, I take part in a narrative continuation that recollects the past to give meaning to the present. Developers have long been considered just engineers, having inherited a historical past where functionality was sanctified. 
Emerging from this fair, however, we witnessed over the decades another historical block of developers comprised of colleagues whose reaction when confronted with a request for functionality would be to explore every option available, from building the system to asking why, and from working as expected to blowing the whistle. For these developers, you exist to question why to build, and you are defined not by what you build, but fundamentally by what you don't. Secondly, coupled with the confrontation of our infinite freedom, existentialism calls us to face our responsibility in a universal scale. Thus, the Sartrean idea of universalism becomes our first compass to the ethical being, a powerful message saying, act as if the entire world is watching you and is waiting to mirror your choices an onward call that nudges our responsibility and renders every choice we make an example of the life we dream of living. For a developer, the concept of universalism would mean that her responsibility begins, not ends with the model she has built. Through her model, she is now responsible to the society at large. Now, if we were to enjoy our freedom and ethics in solitude, these two stages would suffice. However, one cannot perceive freedom as irrespective of a social context. In this sense, our existentialism here is non-individualistic. So the third and final stage of, for our transcendence is a call for action emanating from the conceptual space where Beauvoir's ideas on freedom meet and blend with the views of Hannah Arendt on the realm of the political. Beauvoir writes, and I quote, to will freedom, to want other people to explore the options for liberation, and subsequently to will all of them to be free is one and the same thing. In our own life world, even if we have the technical background to secure our data and privacy, for example, we will not be substantially free. We will have only arranged a larger room to play in. In such a world, my freedom springs from the freedom of my connections. Han Arendt was in turn widely criticized for disclosing an uncomfortable truth, that the ordinary people who facilitated the work of evil people during the, most, the worst moments of human history were not by definition themselves evil monsters. They were people apathetically lured in a bureaucratic maze of collective irresponsibility, deprived from the vital shield of the realm of the political. The countervailing dynamics that led to this devastating inertia during horrendous times are found, according to Arendt, in our collective decision to form societies by neglecting the realm of the political. To conclude, if we are to substitute the traditional bureaucracy that beclouds our freedom and responsibility with a black box society where given the circumstances we try to do the best we can, then our historical past is telling. For it teaches us that in those social ecosystems where no one knows who is responsible, the only species to thrive is the one-dimensional individual whose only contribution in time of crisis will be an eerie silence. The architects of the future on-life societies need to bring the political back to the equation of our existence not only by embracing their absolute freedom and becoming aware of the politics of their profession, but by looking to all those who feel the impact of algorithmic system and by inviting them to take part in the politics of the co-creation of our collective futures. Beauvoir, keep, Beauvoir keeps reminding her readers something which I find a very good way to end this talk with. She writes, and I quote, to will freedom is to will the freedom of others. Thank you very much.